Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to CGST and joining our lecture this evening. Uh, this lecture is co-organized by CGST and Institute of Sino-Christian uh, Studies. The uh, Institute of Sino-Christian Studies is committed to promote the contextualization of Christianity as far well as um, the dialogues between uh, different cultures and religion. Uh, this lecture is indeed a rare and wonderful opportunity for us to dialogue with uh, orthodox tradition. We are uh, very delighted to have uh, Dr. Augustine Sokolovsky in our midst this evening. Dr. Augustine so uh, Sokolovsky is the rector of the, the Orthodox community in Bienn, Switzerland, and guest professor of uh, the Institute of Sino-Christian Studies. He is also an academic board member of the Institute for Ecumenical Studies at the University of Freiburg. The topic he is going to present this evening is when East meets West. Augustine of Hippo and the Western Fathers in Orthodox Theology and Piety. After Dr. Sokolovsky's presentation, we'll have Mr. Andrew Warren uh, to give us uh, his response. Andrew is our assistant professor at CGST. He is a um, doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford. His academic interest and expertise is on the thought of spirit, um, the thought and spirituality of Augustine of Hippo. So we cannot have a better respondent to uh, this evening. So please uh, let us welcome our speaker, Dr. Sokolovsky. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to speak here uh, before you about uh, St. Augustine and uh, Orthodox theology and piety. Before we begin to consider uh, uh, the reception of Augustine in Orthodox theology and piety, it is important to outline what, what actually Orthodoxy is. It is very important because it helps to better understand uh, specifics that simply need to be taken into account before starting to consider one or another theological issue. In uh, their theological discourse, representatives of the Orthodox tradition talk about orthodoxy. Typically, they mean, they mean two things at the same time, but uh, normally this is uh, not indicated. Firstly, by orthodoxy, we mean the entire ancient theological, moral, and ascetic tradition created in the Christian East, that is, in Palestine, Syria, Egypt, Asia, Asia Minor, and Constantinople. Everything that comes from this original matrix is considered orthodox by default. This is a very important hermeneutical attitude. As a rule, orthodox theologians necessarily adhere to it, but at the same time, they, they are not aware of it. Let us note that in this context, the Western fathers of the Church, and mainly Augustine, seem to immediately fall out of sight of Orthodox authors. In other words, Orthodoxy in this sense means ancient Eastern Christianity. Secondly, by Orthodoxy we mean the Church and tradition which at a certain point in history came into conflict with the Roman Church, and the churches that at that time were subject to its uh, authority. After the break in communion between Rome and Orthodoxy, so it is commonly said, Orthodoxy began a separate existence. For a very long time, it was generally accepted that the date of the separation of the churches of the East and West was 1054. Indeed, then the leadership of the churches of Rome and Constantinople 
excommunicated each other from church communion and anathematized each other. Since then, these, decision, uh, these, the, these, these decisions have not been reversed. However, in modern times, through the works of Professor Christoph Zutner from Vienna and Klaus Wirwold from Regensburg and others, this date has been called into question. In my opinion, the year 1453 should be considered the date of the division of the churches. churches. Then Constantinople was taken by the Ottomans and the Eastern Roman Empire ceased to exist. This empire outlived the Roman Empire by a thousand years. At the same time of the Ottoman triumph, Constantinople was a small city-state with a population of only a few tens of thousands of people. However, the symbolic significance of this event was enormous. Moreover, the Ottoman sultans considered themselves not destroyers, but successors to the emperors of Constantinople. Therefore, they immediately began territorial expansion. In my opinion, I propose the date of uh, separation of churches of East and West is 1453, the fall of Constantinople. It is interesting that shortly before the fall of Constantinople in 1439, the unity of the churches of Rome and Constantinople was restored at the Council of Florence. Despite the fact that this decision did not have time to undergo the necessary reception, formally by 1453 this unity existed. Ottoman power took control of Constantinople the Ottomans refounded the empire. From now on, they themselves became its center. At the same time, they reformated the Orthodox Church. In this context, it will be important to define what orthodoxy is. The complexity of such a definition lies in the fact that within one term, various historical, theological, philosophical and even political factors are combined. Therefore, we will try to simply list such definitions. So, first, orthodoxy is Christianity, which in the first centuries of the history of the Church was formed in the territories of Palestine, Syria, Egypt, Asia Minor, and subsequently spread to other countries. Second, it's the church that existed on the territory of the Eastern Roman Empire with its capital in Constantinople, as well as those churches on the territory of Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Asia Minor, Russia, later in Slavic countries, that until a certain point in history formed a single whole with it, and they, then they continued to be in liturgical and Eucharistical communion. These two definitions are based on origin, geography, history, and ecclesiastical organization. If we analyze the role of St. Augustine in the context of such definitions of orthodoxy, it will be minimal. The reason for this is the fact that Augustine lived in a different historical, geographical, and ecclesiastical context. His Christianity was African, Roman, Western. As he himself said about himself, I am an African, Africanus sum. Further, orthodoxy is right, correct, orthodox faith. It's about etymology. And also the Greek word doxa, which is the basis of the term orthodox, also means glory, glorification, doxology. For instance, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit is the same term. Therefore, the word orthodoxy can mean a way, a way of properly glorifying God. This definition of orthodoxy can be called not only theological, but also aesthetic. It largely became popular during the postmodern era. We also find it by Dostoevsky that the beauty will save our world. And finally, this is maybe my personal definitions of what orthodoxy is. 
It is the official confession of faith adopted in the Roman Empire at the level of religious legislation during the Christian period of its history. By default, this definition applies to the Ottoman Empire as the legal successor of the Eastern Roman Empire, to the Russian Empire in some forms of Orthodox statehood. We have here an icon of the exaltation of the Holy Cross, one of the 12 greatest feasts of the Orthodox liturgical year. And it is a unique feast which can be called a political feast because uh, it is uh, about the triumph of the Holy Cross in the universe. Very important example of what Orthodoxy actually is. Also official confession of faith. In this context, consideration of the role of St. Augustine in Orthodox theology seems most difficult. For instance, uh, the decisions, decisions of the Fourth Ecumenical Council 451 in Chalcedon on Christology are based on the theology of Augustine. The Council itself does not refer to Augustine but follows the Christology of the Roman Church of the era of Pope Leo the Great. In the doctrine of Christ, he was a follower of Augustine. In turn, the decisions of the Seventh Council of Nicaea in 787 on iconography rather contradict the logic of Augustine's thinking, although he did not write about iconography. Both rules were part of the official confession of the empire in their respective eras. Now, Augustine is he sent or blessed? In Orthodox literature, in European languages as well as in Russian, it is customary to call Augustine of Hippo blessed. Therefore, not only in secular literature, in theology, in philosophy, but also in the liturgical calendar, Augustine is called not Saint Augustine, but Blessed Augustine. Many theologians, and philosophers, as well as, as outside observers, presume that this appellation is not accidental. They claim that this is a sign that allegedly indicates the following factors. First, insufficient holiness. Let us remember that in the Roman Catholic Church there is a difference between saints and blessed. A saint is a right person canonized by the Church who is revered by the entire Church. It's an obligation for the Universal Church to uh, celebrate the memory of a saint. He and this person is commemorated as a saint. His or her name is placed in the liturgical calendar. This veneration and invocation extend to all church dioceses and regions. Blessed is a righteous person whose canonization took place only at the local level. He or she is venerated in individual dioceses. It is possible that it will be subsequently widerspread in the whole universal church, but it is also possible that this will not happen. The holiness of the blessed is, as it were, incomplete holiness or holiness in the process of waiting. The Orthodox Church also distinguishes between local and universal saints, but does not know such terminology. This is no formal, there is no formal difference in terminology between saints and blessed. However, by analogy taken from the Catholic tradition, many Orthodox believe that Augustine is not a saint who is venerated in Orthodoxy. Second, in addition, a righteous people who are revered in popular piety but are not formally canonized by the Church are often called blessed. This is modern terminology. However, by the logic of anachronism and appropriation, it is often applied to Augustine. One more question. Blessed in the proper sense in Orthodoxy are the saints who have been canonized by the Church and are revered at the universal level as fools for Christ's sake. In Orthodox ideology, it is generally accepted that holy fools voluntarily assumed the appearance of madness and dementia. 
they have abandoned the full use of their rationality in their mental facilities, faculties in order to acquire humility and avoid praise and pride. Also, neither Augustine nor, uh, for instance, St. Jerome is also called uh, blessed in the Orthodox tradition. They were ever perceived as holy fools. Calling them blessed helps to take their theology and legacy with some skepticism. Automatically, if you say St. Augustine, he is only blessed. People start thinking about this, uh, those, uh, and this uh, fool in Christ who were a little bit strange people and didn't do and didn't practice theology. And it is very difficult to enter discussion because as soon as they hear this uh, notion of being blessed, they stop reflection on the theological meanings and teachings of Augustine. This is um, some kind of uh, semantic anachronism that also works. It is important to note that the very name blessed in relation to Augustine in orthodoxy is a truss of deep archaism. The fact is that the name of Augustine has appeared in various legends about saints over the centuries. It is found in ancient editions of, editions of the Psalter. However, such mention of him has always been abstract. In the strict sense of the word, neither Augustine nor, for instance, Jerome, were norm, known in the Orthodox world. The name of both was absent from the Orthodox liturgical calendar. Theologian and mystic reformer of piety and Eucharistic life of Greek Orthodoxy, Nicodemus the Agiorite, supplemented the liturgical calendar and added the names of Augustine in Jerome to it, but it was in the beginning of the 19th century. It uh, doesn't mean anything because Orthodox liturgical calendar at that time was simply incomplete. But some people think that uh, that is the main proof that uh, Augustine is somebody who is not considered saint in the Orthodox world. Moreover, the very date of memory of Saint Augustine was, tru was chosen al arbitrarily, June 15 does not have any connection with the biography of uh, these saints. Probably there was an abbot on the Mount Athos in Greece who celebrated his birthday or something else like this. And that's why they put the memory of St. Augustine say, same, on the same day. The archaic title blessed is a consequence of such acceptance into the calendar without any official reception or theological reflection. It is interesting that in modern Greek Orthodoxy, Augustine is sometimes called Eros, sacred. This is how saints are called in the Greek tradition, saints whose memory is especially important for the church. For instance, John Chrysostom is called sacred and his veneration in Eastern Orthodoxy is a long-standing and extremely important tradition. Here we have uh, three authors I prepared analyzing the role of St. Augustine, which is with, here I, I would like to put the picture of Nicodemus Zagiorite, who put the name of Augustine into a liturgical calendar. Very interesting theologian. Also, he was missionary, ascetic. He also was one of the pioneers of the frequent communion because uh, before him in Greek Orthodoxy, they got communion maybe once a year, once in, in some months during uh, for Easter maybe, but he was a pioneer of uh, continuous communion. And that's very interesting that he put the name. He, and he was also one of the publishers and authors of the Philokalia edition in Greek language. Very interesting that he got in touch with the memory of St. Augustine. And now what I would like to mention 
through, throughout its history, the Orthodox tradition has existed in specific contexts. The main factors that radically changed the mode of existence of Orthodoxy were revolution in Russia 1917, Asia Minor disaster, that's in the year 20 of the 20th century, Pan-Arabism and the beginning of the collapse of Levantine Christianity. In the 20th century, Orthodox Christianity underwent enormous changes. I would identify these three factors. As a result of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, not only the monarchy fell, but also the period of Orthodox statehood ended. The Orthodox political system, which theologians call the Constantinian period, uh, we saw the icon with uh, some emperors having the Holy Cross. It was uh, best image of what we call Constantinian period in the church history, has become a thing of the past. As a result of the subsequent civil war, millions of Orthodox Christians found themselves abroad and began a new life in the countries of the Western world. The second factor was the so-called Asia Minor Catastrophe, when as a result of the Greek-Turkish Greek War, there was an exchange of populations between Turkey and Greece. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire resulted in the displacement of millions of Orthodox Greek towards Greece. Since the latter could not accept such a number of immigrants, many of them moved to North America. And it is how a huge Orthodox diaspora arose in the Western world. Finally, the collapse of the colonial system, the emergence of the ideology of Pan-Arabism and Arab nationalism also contributed to the fact that numerous Orthodox Christians who had previously lived for centuries in the Middle East, particularly in Egypt, were forced to leave their places of former residence. This is how a new era was formed when the Orthodox world began to come into close contact with the Western world. As often happens in globalization processes, the question of self-identification has arisen. arisen. It was a gradual process. As a symbolic starting point, I would like to indicate the expulsion of Russian intellectuals from Russia by Lenin. And that was the, for, for the first time in history that Orthodox intellectuals found themselves in a completely Roman Catholic or Protestant environment. An intense process of reflection began the question of how, in fact, orthodoxy differs from Western Christianity has acquired a particularly extreme actuality. To summarize, we can briefly outline what was, what happened at that time. Orthodox began to be, of being aware of their belonging to the church. According to the text of the Creed, it was one holy Catholic and apostolic church. However, Western Christians could say the same about themselves. It was necessary to find such characteristic, uh, a special characteristic to identify one's own tradition. And this one was Church of the Fathers. What means Church of the Fathers? If we go to the ecumenical councils, we can find uh, a canon from the Fifth Ecumenical Council, 553, uh, where it is said, we follow in everything the Holy Fathers and teachers of the Holy Church of God, that is Athanasius, Hilary, Basil, Gregory, the theologian, Gregory of Nyssa, Ambrose, Theophilus, John Chrysostom, Cyril, Augustine, Proclus, Leo. And we accept everything that is written and they explain about the right faith and the condemnation of heretics. Here we see that Augustine and Leo represent Western Christianity, the other fathers, mostly the Eastern one. It is very important that the name of Augustine is mentioned in this ancient canon, and in, in some way it becomes an obligation to to have respect towards St. Augustine, but why he is mentioned in this context is unclear, because St. Augustine was not, no, was not known in the Orthodox Christianity. 
And that's why it is important to see how some Orthodox theologians treat Augustine, what they say about him. First, I took one of the Serbian and Russian theologians, Ambrose Pogodin. It's very important that he got this uh, double Orthodox origin from Serbia in France and also served in different countries. In his uh, article on St. Augustine called uh, Orthodox Church and Blessed Augustine, Ambrose Pogodin outlines his perception of Augustine. In doing so, he responds to the harsh criticism of the theology of Augustine, which was carried out by certain representatives of the Greek Orthodox conservative circles of the 20th century. It is uh, characteristic that already in the title of his article, Ambrose calls Augustine blessed. This means that he is not ready to equate Augustine with, the, with other ancient fathers of the Church, who are usually, as I said, called saints. According to Ambrose, the Greek theologian Michael Atsku calls Augustine the father of all heretics, the cause of Roman Catholic and Protestant errors. He also believes that Augustine is not one of the Orthodox saints, and Ambrose Pogodin try, tries to respond to him. The first issue that Pogodin considers is Augustine's teaching on grace and predestination. In doing so, he immediately refers his reader to the work of uh, Seraphim Rose, another Orthodox uh, theologian of the past century. At the same time, he notes that uh, he intends to correct, to complement Rose, but also to distance himself from him. Ambrose interprets Augustine's teaching on grace as follows. After the fall, man needs grace. However, he can reject grace. Grace strengthens the saints in their heroism, states Pogodin. In essence, predestination and foreknowledge of God in Augustine's understanding coincide. Very strange conclusion because we know that uh, this distinction between predestination and prescience is uh, one of the most important uh, things in the grace theology of Saint Augustine. It was also very typical after for the whole development of the of, of dogma in the whole Western traditions and we we know about it but he apparently didn't want to know about it. It's very very special uh, methodological, it's hermeneutical uh, attitude. At the same time, Pogodin believes that the Roman Catholic Church rejects Augustine's teaching on grace. Why? Since Catholic ethics is built on a person acquisition of merit before God, and because John Calvin subsequently taught about predestination. So Probably Ambrose Pogodin was a very good specialist in church fathers, but he didn't study Western tradition. That's why he came to such conclusions that Catholics did reject St. Augustine and that John Calvin is right. He taught about predestination, yes. Ambrose refers to his colleague Seraphim Rose, who argued that Augustine's teaching was, was orthodox, but it was characterized by exaggerated language, which gave rise to incorrect interpretations. Pogodin makes a short excursion into the research of Russian theologians of the 19th century on Augustine and concludes that the Greek fathers of the church were dogmatics, while blessed Augustine is an excellent moralist. Very interesting remark because uh, I would say Pelagius was a moralist, but not said Augustine. Nevertheless, for, for Ambrose Pogodin, Augustine was a moralist. It's very important because uh, such cliches are still alive. If, if you speak uh, with an Orthodox Christian who knows about St. Augustine, he will probably respond uh, the same thing. The second question of Augustine's theology, which uh, Pogodin discusses, is the famous question of the procession of the Holy Spirit. Here, 
His answer is Augustine's doctrine of the Trinity is not formulated with precision, it is incomplete. Sometimes I read uh, Augustine's work on the Trinitate, on Trinity, and I doubt whether it is incomplete. Uh, and we, we, we see this hermeneutical attitude, which is a very special one. Unlike uh, the doctrine of grace and predestination, where Ambrose simply puts his own point of view into Augustine's mouth, it is not possible for him to do the same on the issue of the procession of the Holy Spirit. Subsequent tradition, and most importantly, the Carolingian theologians themselves, refer to Augustine in this matter. It is too obvious. That's why Pogodin quotes Photius of Constantinople, Archbishop of Constantinople of the, uh, in, 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 in ninth century, who says that works of Augustine were probably falsified. He didn't uh, teach about filioque or about the double procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and from the Son, but his works were falsified. Very interesting opinion, which matched probably for uh, that time, but uh, Pogodin, he is a theologian from the 20th century and he still repeats this opinion. Another theologian about whom I would like to speak is, uh, is a Greek theologian from Boston, George Papadimitriou. What is interesting about him, already the title of his article, St. Augustine in the Greek Orthodox Tradition. He rightly points out that within the framework of a single Orthodox Christianity, various independent traditions have already formed. Therefore, the theology of each must be studied separately. If we speak in details, we have to speak about St. Augustine in Greek tra in, in, in Greek Orthodox in, in Greek Orthodox tradition, in Serbian, in Russian, maybe in, there is also a small Polish Orthodox uh, Church with uh, its own theologians, but we have no time. Anyway, we see that uh, in this in his article he already points to it that Saint Augustine in the Greek Orthodox tradition. Papa Dimitriou consistently examines the place of Augustine in the works of those authors who, in his opinion, can obviously be considered as a kind of topoi of Greek Orthodox history. This is uh, Photios of Constantinople, we spoke about him, and uh, Gregory Palamas, teacher of grace in the Orthodox tradition, and also that this new personality in this uh, Augustinian study in the Orthodox world, the Patriarch of Constantinople, the first Ottoman Patriarch, Gennadius Holarius. After this, he moves on to the modern period. The conclusion of this review is also quite characteristic. And uh, the periodization is very typical. For instance, For instance, uh, he also speaks about uh, Marcos of Ephesus and uh, the Union of Florence. What is important that uh, speaking about the Council of Florence, Papa Dimitriou admits that Augustine was a pro-Latin theologian. And in this moment, some kind of new confession is emerging because here Augustine's authority is very limited by Papa Dimitriou. And he says if his theology or if Augustine in his theology differs in some way from others, Augustine had to be subordinated to the general teaching of the Orthodox Church. We see this, uh, this balance between West and East, which is uh, very important to understand how Orthodox theology speaks about St. Augustine. Apparently, 
we have here under the pen of uh, Papa Dimitriou some kind of instrumentalization of Augustine, characteristic of all subsequent orthodoxy. There is no reception of his theology, but a conditional reference to it is necessary since it proves the adherence of the orthodox to patristic authorities. Speaking about the role of Augustinus Augustine in the modern Greek Orthodox tradition, Papa Dimitrio also mentions that it was Nicodemus the Agurite who included the name of Augustine in the liturgical calendar of saints. The name of Nicodemus, as I said, is associated with the revival of religious life, and Papa Dimitrio also says that Nicodemus wrote about Augustine with all praiseworthy epithets. Papa Dimitrio lists several authors who have called for the integration of Augustine into the life and theology of the Orthodox Church today. He also writes that some modern Greek theologians subjected Augustine to harsh criticism. Thus, one involuntarily gets the impression that Orthodox piety, Nicodemus, and the monastic tradition obliges to respect the authority of Augustine, while Orthodox theology as theology Romanidis and other theologians, characteristic of the modern Greek Christian traditions, judges Augustine on the basis of its own, of their own criteria, methodology and hermeneutics. The question arises about the criteria. Should Augustine's theology be taken as a matrix for conclusions about the theology of flatter times or vice versa? One more theologian, it's uh, very famous in, in uh, English-speaking Orthodox world, Seraphim Rose. He was uh, very knowledgeable about modern Western philosophy and culture. His perception of Augustine is extremely interesting. He dedicated a separate small monograph to Augustine. Uh, the reception of Seraphim is important because it is not just a theological treatise, but a kind of exercise in piety. Rawls consistently strives to remind his modern Orthodox leader of the good name of Augustine. The audience he was addressing was Western. During the Iron Curtain period, his work simply could not be accessible to readers in most Orthodox countries. Unlike Ambrose Pogodin, who was a scholar in patristics and translator of the Church Fathers, Seraphim Rose obviously mastered contemporary philosophical issues. He studied modern religiosity, sects, wrote on philosophical issues, and was keenly interested in everything happening in the world. This was to give his work on Augustine and orthodoxy special interest. Very interesting fact is that he uh, what is the periodization that is historical moments in which Rose studies Augustine. There are there are the times of Photios of Constantinople. We have uh, the Union of Florence, Mark of Ephesus, and uh, also we have. Uh, some modern issues. It is very interesting that all three authors put speak about Nicodemus from the holy mountain. They, they all speak about uh, Nicodemus and they want to put to speak about necessity to venerate Augustine in their uh, particular private piety. Wait a moment. I have too many papers here. Yes. I got it.
we know that uh, later tradition after Augustine call teaching about uh, grace and freedom called uh, synergia semi pelagian According to some scientists, this happened quite late. It was probably Martin Luther who first discovered that this doctrine contradicted Augustine's theology. Seraphim Rawls doesn't know about it. He doesn't know probably that Luther called it semi-Pelagianism and accused the modern Catholic Church of holding it, that is, in his opinion, of being in heresy. This brief information is given here only as an excursion. Rawls most likely did not know about this issue. In his argument, Seraphim Rawls contrasts Cassian, John Cassian and Augustine. He considers the theology of Augustine to be orthodox, but his teaching one-sided and close to error. To justify Augustine, Rawls argues that his theology was too conditioned by personal experience. And uh, St. Augustine would have responded by the experience of grace, not personal experience. At the same time, Ross argues that Augustine was too Western and therefore wanted to subordinate the doctrine of God to the laws of human logic. In essence, it seems that the American Orthodox theologian Seraphim Ross is trying to justify Augustine but does not know how to do it. He is uh, too different if it's compared with the Eastern Orthodox or Church Fathers. On the last pages of his work, he says that thanks to the works of John Maximovich, we have him here, a revival of the veneration of Augustine began in Orthodox piety. At one time, biblical scholarship in the 19th century started speaking of the contrast between the historical Jesus and the Christ of dogma. Modern orthodoxy, modern orthodox theology, in fact, reproduces this hymn, this uh, example in relation to St. Augustine. It accepts and honors Augustine in piety and distances itself from Augustine in theology. Nevertheless, John Maximovich, John of Shanghai, because he was bishop for Russian people during 15 years in Shanghai, wrote a worship liturgy to St. Augustine. And here we have a small text dedicated to Augustine. Let us praise the great Augustine, in divine hierarch of Christ's church and wise guide, renowned theologian of the city on high, city on high, city of God a lover of prayer and a pillar of repentance. We have this ascetical approach to St. Augustine, very special because characteristic for the Orthodox tradition. And one more thing, we know that around 720, Augustine's body was transferred to the Lombard capital of Pavia in Northern Italy. It was a uh, placed in the church where already the relics of the philosopher Severinus Boetius were located. And we started a tradition, new one, to celebrate once, once per year a common liturgy, Eucharistic prayer, Orthodox service of all Orthodox clergy named after St. Augustine. Last time we were four, a metropolitan from Ukraine, a priest monk from Russia, and Archimand Wright from South Italy and me. So we hope that uh, we start with piety and we come to a recognition of the merits of St. Augustine also in Orthodox theology and we help Orthodox people to know him better. First of all, because he is one of the greatest theologians of all times, and uh, his teaching were not known for Orthodox tradition, and I think it's very important that we uh, finally meet him in our postmodern era and can enrich our own understanding of Christian ethics and dogma. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Sokolowski, for this very informative lecture. I've been enriched by knowledge of Orthodox history and liturgy, together with an account of how Augustine has been received in the Orthodox tradition. You began by discussing the different senses of the term Orthodoxy. You then explained why Augustine is called blessed rather than saint. You introduced the major historical events which led Orthodoxy to embrace the identity being the Church of the Fathers. You argued that having been named in the act of the Fifth Ecumenical Council should guarantee Augustine's place in Orthodox theology. You also named the Orthodox thinkers who had been engaged in the study of Augustine, but regretted to find that these attempts had so far failed to do justice to the true worth of Augustine's thought. Having outlined these key points, there are a few areas into which I'd like to make further inquiry. The first is about the place of the saints and the fathers in the liturgy and theology of the Orthodox Church. To my understanding, liturgy and theology are absolutely inseparable in orthodoxy, given that both genuine faith and orthodox theology are embedded in the Byzantine rite. Although the rite is celebrated in the vernaculars of the different peoples, it goes back to the same authors who are saints and fathers of the church. Here, I think, lies the significance of the saints and fathers in orthodox life. I'd like to inquire further into the area of sainthood in orthodoxy. In your lecture, you suggested the reason for Augustine being called blessed rather than saint is due to a complex web of factors involving a paradoxical mix of archaism and anachronism. You mentioned that there's no formal difference between the terms blessed and saint. Also, you brought to our attention that the title used for Augustine is somewhat different in the different Orthodox communities. For various, he is usually referred to as blessed in Russian Orthodoxy. He is called sacred in the Greek church. My question is twofold. Is the idea of sainthood in Orthodox something subject to local variations? If that is the case, how does it square with the practice of, um, in the liturgy of the Orthodox Church where the um, where list of saints are read out during the divine liturgy? And I understand the liturgy is common and shared among the, the, Orthodox, uh, different, uh, the Orthodox communities in different ge uh, geographical locations. Also, I'd like to understand whether the idea of sainthood in orthodoxy is a greater concept, um, as, in if, as in whether a father may be more authoritative than another father. And if that is the case, is um, the degree of authority, uh, is, uh, does it depend on the place of a particular father, uh, how, it, how, it occupy, how, it is, um, how it is occupied in the liturgy, um, for example, um, like um, John Chrysostom, he has got a divine liturgy and um, that is named after him. And would that be, uh, for some reason, mean that he's, um, he's more authoritative than some other fathers who are otherwise, um, who are mentioned otherwise? Coming from a Protestant background in which denominationalism is a key phenomenon, I think Protestants can learn a lot from the Orthodox understanding of communion founded upon unity in liturgical practice. My second area of interest is about the turn to um, patristic heritage. Um, you have mentioned a few names um, of Orthodox authors who have um, written um, who have done study on Augustine. Um, you, met, uh, you told us, told us about uh, Ambrose Pagodin, Seraphim Rose, George um, Papadimitriou, 
and John Maximovich. Um, it seems that in the last century, um, it has been a, re uh, a period of renewal in the study of patristics in various quarters. In Roman Catholicism, there was the Pressus Simon movement, or I guess it should be in, um, resourcement in English, that emphasized church reform through a return to patristic sources. Similarly, in Protestantism, there are theologians like T.F. Torrance and Colin Gunton who were engaged in retrieving patristic resources in their doctrinal works. One of the Jesus Simon theologian, Henri de Lubac, goes so far as to say that each time in our West, that Christian renewal has flourished, it has, it has flourished under the sign of the fathers. Being certain that these efforts in returning to patristic heritage have been as rewarding, if not more so in the Eastern Church as in the West, I'm interested in learning about the fruits born by embracing the identity of the Church of the Father. My question is, what does the Orthodox self-understanding being the Church of the Fathers mean in terms of practical life and piety on the one hand, and output in theological writings on the other. I've been interested in um, looking at this like uh, uh, more broadly, like um, going beyond Augustine, uh, um, so that like uh, how the fathers have been appropriated in general in orthodoxy during the last century. Finally, um, I'd like to return to Augustine, more specifically about the place of Augustine in an East-West dialogue. In the description of this lecture, you have raised the question, is it generally legitimate, uh, legitimate to divide the representative of patristic into East and West? I'd like to hear a little bit more from you on this question. Responding to the common way of dividing patristic Trinitarian doctrines into Eastern and Western formulations, Lewis Ayres has demonstrated that such an approach cannot be maintained. And in your lecture, you have alluded to the, to the relevance of Augustine's theology to Orthodox Christianity. The question I'd like to pursue is this. By singling out Augustine in this lecture, presumably because he is often regarded as the most influential among the Western Fathers. What would you anticipate to be the unique contribution that he could make to Orthodox Christianity by a more rigorous um, study into his thoughts? I think I've raised um, some questions to keep this dialogue going for a while. I look forward to being enlightened by your response. Before then, I'd like to once again express my gratitude to you, Dr. Dr. Sokolovsky, for coming up with this very meaningful topic on Augustine of Hippo and the Western Fathers in Orthodox theology and piety. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sokolovsky, uh, giving us uh, such an inspiring nature and Andrew's uh, response. Uh, in order to uh, deepen our uh, dialogue between East and West, uh, I would like to invite uh, our two speakers to come forward again uh, so that uh, we will first have um, a dialogue session between uh, these two speakers before we open the floor to uh, for, for the Q&A session. So uh, please come forward. So after Andrew's uh, response, uh, maybe um, 
Uh, Dr. Uh, Sokolovsky, do, do you have some uh, immediate response to, you would like to give um, or you, you would like to, res uh, uh, to answer um, Andrew's questions? Yes, uh, maybe it's very important that you mentioned that uh, this revival of patristics uh, in uh, Orthodox Christianity was not alone. It was linked with uh, the same, almost the same revival of patristics in Catholic Church and also in Protestant churches and community. And we Orthodox often uh, forget about it. We don't know about it. And also, if we speak about liturgical renouveau liturgique, that's the same story. And that was the fruit, immediate fruit or result of the meeting of different uh, Christians from different denominations, uh, which happened after these uh, three crucial uh, immigration processes in the Western and Eastern world. It's very important. Thank you very much. Uh, what is maybe uh, typical for, uh, for the Orthodox uh, the tradition is that uh, discovering the role of the fathers, Orthodox theologians start speaking or start making or asking who is the church father? What is the era of the fathers? And they came to conclusion that the era of the fathers of the church never ends. And that's maybe very typical or the crucial point of the Orthodox understanding of fathers. It means that every time, every moment, every moment in human history, in every moment, Orthodox Church has to be able to produce new fathers of the Church. From, from an hermeneutical point of view, it's uh, problematic because we know uh, more or less patristic era stops with the emergence or with, uh, with uh, arrival of, of, of Islam. Why? I didn't find any sufficient explanation personally, I think, because the whole world view was broken. Uh, fathers were sure that uh, a complete Christianization of our uh, world started and uh, soon or later the whole world will be Christian. And then, and that uh, the human, that human history follows a logical uh, step towards this Christian, pan-Christian unity. And then suddenly a new religion emerges and start conquering new uh, faithful territories and especially Eastern Christianity has to resign from all these plans. And I think that was the end of the patristic era. A very interesting question about saints because uh, for me personally it's very important as uh, the pandemic began. I had no opportunity as all of us to academical work offline, so I start writing on saints. And uh, what I, it seemed to me be very, no, I, I, I was sure I know a lot about saints and I discovered that uh, I knew quite few about saints. And uh, one of those saints was St. Augustine. I knew about him, but he said it's uh, this personal approach to the holiness in our world was very interesting because he also lived in a very critical moment of human history. I discovered a lot of uh, very precious and rare saints, for instance, martyrs of Alexandria who died during the pandemics in the middle of third century as uh, Bishop uh, Dionysius the Great of Alexandria. Uh, he helped sick people during the pandemic and all pagans escaped the city. And many Christians died because of this uh, social work. 
and uh, Dionysius Deni of Alexandria, he canonized immediately all those martyrs, as he called, of Alexandria, a very interesting example. You mentioned liturgy and sainthood. We still, we use do, uh, only two Eucharistical prayer in our uh, tradition. One is called San John Chrysostom, a second one, uh, Basil the Great or Basil of Caesarea. They lived in the uh, 4th and 5th century. And actually, some scholars think that uh, both texts were written by, uh, one text was written by John and second by Basil, but it's not sure because some scholars think that the, the, those both texts were named because they came from their episcopal cities, so from Antioch of John Chrysostom and Caesarea from Caesarea Basil the Great. What does it mean for uh, Orthodox tradition that uh, this uh, link or connection between uh, theology, because uh, Eucharistic prayer, it's always about theology. It's very theological, it addressed to the Father, in the Son through the Holy Spirit. It, it's a very theological work, but it is linked and deeply connected with uh, concrete saints. So we don't imagine to pray with words by some unknown theologian. We need some uh, approach to a concrete human holiness. And if you ask me about St. Augustine and his uh, possible uh, contribution to the Orthodox theology, I think it's very important to speak about grace because uh, for sure we use the word uh, grace in uh, the Orthodox tradition, but the meaning is completely different. For us, grace means, for, means uh, ascetical work and uh, results of this ascetical work in our personal life for perfection and holiness. Grace is deeply connected with liturgical life and personal life and prayer, but we don't know about uh, the redemptive uh, meaning of grace, what is crucial if we read uh, St. Paul. It's crucial for his understanding of the whole history of salvation, that grace means also Jesus Christ given to, to us for the salvation of the whole world. And also maybe political theology, because uh, after Constantine the Great, Eastern Christianity started being uh, connected or linked with uh, the empire. Uh, why? Because uh, many authors, but the most important was, I think, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea. He uh, was quite sure that in this uh, Christianization of uh, biography of Constantine the Great, his baptism on the dead bed and so on, was given a great blessing to the, not only to the church, but also to the history of the world. And this uh, hermeneutical approach goes on. It was never questioned. And Augustine was uh, outside of all those stories. Uh, Eusebius was first very close to the emperor. He knew him personally. Augustine was in his native Africa. And we got uh, 2,000 bishops at that time. And if we take uh, a patriarch or a bishop of Caesarea as uh, Basil, they were very highly positioned. And Augustine was between first and second thousand of bishops, and he didn't care about the empire. For him, what was important was the salvation of, uh, of his uh, flock. And uh, that's why in his De Civitate Dei, he said it's okay, it's very happy event that uh, the empire became Christian, but one they may be, uh, it will not be Christian anymore. We have to stay and to be Christian. And I think uh, we need this uh, more skeptical approach in our own understanding of, I would call it uh, political 
theology. And uh, Augustine is, uh, in this sense, a monk. Fathers, he is uh, unique who could provide us such an answer. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Andrew, do you have uh, any follow-up question <laughs> on, uh, on this area? Yes, um, yeah, thank you for your response. Um, it's very helpful um, to know that um, the fathers um, in, in orthodoxy, um, we have the idea of, like uh, usually we think about patristic, we think about an end point, but, then, um, but you mentioned that um, the church should, there should be fathers at all time. Um, so um, I would like to follow up on this. Um, I think um, the father's place in orthodoxy is quite uh, significant to the self-understanding of the orthodox church. You mentioned that um, in the last century, there has, uh, there, there has been a few um, momentous uh, historical events which um, impacted the orthodox church quite significant, significant, uh, significantly. Um, you mentioned that um, the world was supposed to become Christian, but then all of a sudden, um, um, it has to it had to fight for your own exist uh, for for its own existence. So, um, did these event, uh, this, did these events in any way change the self understanding of the of the Orthodox Christian, and also the way they think about the fathers? Yeah, so that's my. That's a, that's, a, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a point that I would like to follow up on. I think that uh, orthodox understanding of the fathers become much more uh, personalistic and uh, ascetic. So first, fathers were also, teach first of all, were teachers of dogmatics and true theologians. After, it, uh, they started being more uh, personal saints. In some kind, it was a process of mythologization of fathers. You mentioned also that uh, St. Augustine is very different if you compare him to other fathers. Why? Because his biography is very known. And even some moments we can restore it day by day. But only, not only him is very known, we also, if we read uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, he is very personal and uh, he sometimes he is happy. He calls, uh, oh, my Trinity, uh, I'm happy defending uh, my Orthodox faith in Constantinople. Sometimes he is very depressive and he quotes Greek uh, ancient pagan authors and he forgets about his uh, philosophical or uh, theological roots. I think uh, Orthodox uh, people after the, uh, this uh, huge uh, uh, reform, uh, I would say, uh, after the arrival of Islam, they start, they start rethinking the role of the fathers and they start also forgetting about their personal dimension. Fathers became figures on the firmament of, uh, of, of, of the Orthodox faith, but not concrete personalities uh, need that, uh, who needed also analysis and also chronology, biography, pers personal approach. And I think this revival of the patristic theology was also due to the fact that uh, even if uh, if the orthodox if orthodox world was very separated from the rest of the world, academic theology, especially in Russian Empire, was uh, very high leveled. And uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, even theological teaching was given in Latin language. You know, imagine people praying. Uh, Church Slavonic speaking Russian dialects. You have la noblesse, nobility in Russian Empire, speaking French, and uh, priests and theologians uh, doing theology in Latin uh, language. It, uh, it means that uh, 
theological, educational parkour was the same as in the West, but uh, contents were different. But it was uh, so difficult to understand that nobody cared about it. And I think this discovery of the fathers in the 20th century was, was very important because we finally started studying uh, ourselves and understand that we are different. It's not, it's, uh, not bad or good, but uh, difference is a gift given by God. I think that was the most important uh, meaning of the patristic uh, revival in the 20th century. So, um, uh, from from your original uh, uh, script, I I have uh, read uh, some uh, message uh, from from your uh, speech that um, uh, the uh, the Orthodox tradition has skipped uh, uh, some historical moments, uh, which is very important to the Western tradition, like um, the Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment and uh, uh, all these uh, important historical moments. So do you think uh, this is um, a, uh, a theological pro or it is a theological con for, for the Orthodox tradition? For many who become Orthodox in our time, it's a huge pro because you have a church which didn't uh, compromise itself with uh, today's world. Also in history, it's very easy to be orthodox, and if you hear Inquisition, no idea, persecution of heretics, we didn't do it, and so on. <laughs> but uh, when people are already orthodox, they start questioning about philosophical issues, how to deal with the Reformation, with all those immense themes and topics and challenges we live, we not always have uh, appropriate questions because we didn't have this experience. And that's why I think uh, ecumenical dialogue is so important because we can enrich each other and learn from each other. We cannot, in a moment, live all those uh, things we didn't live, uh, like uh, Enlightenment, Renaissance, uh, Reformation, Modernity, maybe Postmodernity. But let's live it together in order not to repeat our uh, uh, errors before we did before. Um, well, um, we are coming from uh, evangelical tradition, so Protestant, basically. So uh, for the Protestant tradition, the scripture is very important. We have uh, scripture principles, sola scriptura. So um, uh, compared with uh, the, the Orthodox Church, it seems to me that um, uh, the church fathers is very important to your tradition. So um, in, in your opinion or in your observation, what, what is the place of scripture in the Orthodox tradition compared with the church fathers? Very important question, as I teach in, uh, in theological academy or seminary, that dogmatics. My first, or my, one of my first questions was, uh, did somebody read uh, the whole Bible as whole? <laughs> no? And almost nobody answered yes. <laughs> also, second question, uh, do you read sometimes uh, the fathers? and whom do they quote, each other or uh, uh, their predecessors? No, uh, usually they uh, all, their spirituality, theology is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They knew that by heart, the question of how did they interpret it, it it's a different question, but anyway, all the fathers were deeply rooted in the scripture. And I think we, uh, in our Orthodox tradition, it's a huge lack of this uh, immediate approach to the Bible. We have to read and to reread it, and it's uh, still, maybe we lived already a liturgical revival, patristical revival, maybe let's now start with biblical revival. I think it's important. <laughs> 
So do, do you expect a, a, a awful dust version of Martin Luther will coming up? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Luther was too Augustinian. Uh, first we have to, to study Augustine and then... <laughs> Okay, do you, uh, Andrew, do you, do you have other questions for Dr. Sukulovsky? Um, yeah, I think I have one more question. I know your interest is, is in uh, ecumenism. And um, so um, I would like to hear more about um, the work that you have been doing. Do you see ecumenism, uh, ecumenism as um, uh, primarily something that... Um, that can be fulfilled academically or through dialogue or, yeah, I just because um, yeah, it's a topic that interested me and I think uh, it's a very important subject to uh, the fact that we are having dialogue here, I think is um, part of, part of uh, the effort towards uh, Christian union. So um, I'd like to um, hear you share about your expertise. I think we are in a very difficult situation because uh, the ecumenical movement started in the beginning of the 20th century is uh, become very, you know, disappointed and weak. And uh, all those uh, great hopes now are not actual anymore. Why different answers? Maybe because uh, we were in modernity now in postmodernity, maybe difference become too important maybe theological and philosophical dimensions also not so important we have to be in aesthetics and also huge political issue about what we are and uh, is it not better to be separated than to be united there is no quest for unity anymore and i think it uh, also has its uh, repercussions in the ecumenical for the ecumenical movement the best example of ecumenism in my personal experience was as i was in a conference in singapore and uh, i didn't know that uh, it was a huge conference and uh, i was sent by freiburg and i was sure i will meet some catholics orthodox protestants but i was almost alone in a huge protestant congregation and uh, people I discussed with were uh, Russian Baptists, you know, and uh, they are very conservative, very true Baptists, you know, uh, and, and, but I discovered that they didn't know at that time enough about their uh, classical Baptist theology. Yes, and uh, I asked, what do you mean about Trinity, about... Uh, redemption, grace, baptism, and answers, in my understanding, were not uh, enough good. And so I said, guys, you are Baptist. You were born from heaven in your tradition. Probably you will be always Baptist till you are in heaven, <laughs> where there is no confession in sense of denomination. Let's let me please teach you a little bit about the, the, your own doctrine. And I also want other Christians to teach me about uh, the Orthodox faith, tradition, understanding. And what actually I noticed also studying in a different context in Freiburg, that I learned a lot about my own tradition from uh, not non-Orthodox people, Catholics, Protestants. Best way uh, to pray I learned from some uh, Protestant Christians. I mean best way in sense of being able to pronounce word of prayer immediately, you know, immediately, this immediate way of addressing God. And I think maybe it's one of the possibilities or hopes for a future ecumenical dialogue to share experiences of each other and uh, to understand that we are not perfect. We are not perfect. Let's uh, think about our roots and uh, also uh, go towards the uh, future because uh, Christians in the world are now in minority. Even 
in statistics maybe not, but uh, Christian uh, faith was never about statistics. And let's go very uh, small flock towards, uh, towards a true ecumenical uh, dialogue where, where, where we are all different, but all together. Okay, um, so uh, I think uh, we, we are now uh, opening the floor to, uh, to the Q&A session. So uh, you are most welcome to uh, raise your question to uh, two of our speakers. So uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, please come forward and uh, use uh, the mic in, in the middle of, of uh, our room. And uh, for the sake of the time, so um, uh, each one, uh, please raise one question and finish it uh, within a minute. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, well, so uh, we can now start. Uh, hello, I, uh, my name's Keen. I, I teach church history here. Um, so, uh, just bordering your, your scope a little bit. First, uh, first, I'd like to thank you. You are so uh, humble in presenting your Orthodox tradition. And I find that sometimes it's not true in some other Orthodox <laughs> writers, okay? <laughs> so, very good. Uh, secondly, um, just a, that's my question. Actually, um, in, in terms of purely population statistics, the Orthodox tradition is in a pretty bad situation. Uh, Russians, Eastern Europeans, they are not reproducing children. Uh, so uh, my, my question is that, that in, in the Orthodox community, do they have a sense like how the church can survive, the Orthodox church can survive both the decline of the church and the attack of modernity and so forth, so on? Do they have a sense of uh, crisis facing the church or do they have any discussion how to face the problem of the Orthodox community at large today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, Orthodoxy is not anymore uh, Orthodoxy in a, a definite country or somewhere uh, on earth, but uh, you have everywhere Orthodox uh, communities in the diaspora. And actually, we speak about 14 Orthodox churches, which are independent. And um, if you compare, it's more or less the model of the Anglican Communion. Uh, it's not... Uh, it, 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 it wasn't a project, but it's, it, it's going this direction, being a kind of confederation of churches. And you have to speak about uh, each tradition differently because in different countries you have different situations. But uh, I think that uh, we lived the a time of persecution during the Soviet past and we were so happy that it uh, ended that we still not questioned ourselves what will come in the future. And Orthodoxy has uh, a very strong identity with uh, culture, ethnicity, history, particular history of uh, its uh, own land, country. If you want to comp compare, com that I compare, it's a little bit like Polish uh, Catholicity. You know, everybody was happy with. Uh, lot of people in churches during uh, the Soviet time. Then uh, John Paul II was uh, the greatest uh, Polish of all times. Now everything changed, but uh, Polish Catholics still inside this reality. I think it's more or less uh, that answer. But you have also orthodoxy in the United States, uh, in uh, South America, you have uh, in South Africa uh, strong 
uh, Greek community, in, they are more aware of all these uh, uh, challenges we face or we will face. I think uh, the answer is yes and not, but not in a, such a, you know, if you compare with the West or with, with Catholics or Protestants, uh, we are still, we are not aware yet of uh, all those new challenges we will face uh, in coming future. Uh, my name is Cherry. Um, I'm also a church historian. Um, thank you so much for Father Sokolowski's presentation and Andrew's uh, response, which are both very helpful for us, uh, who all claim ourselves as the descendants of the Latin tradition, while we're having mostly Asian, uh, Asian faces, <laughs> ethically. Um, but this is a great opportunity for all of us to learn about how the Orthodox community has been receiving Augustine's teaching. I actually had three, three questions. So <laughs> I'm trying to combine two of, the, <laughs> two of them. Um, so uh, did Father uh, so, uh, Sokolowski uh, do you uh, notice any similar negation occurred in some other uh, church fathers considered as Latin fathers, such as Ambrose, Jerome, and perhaps a little bit later, Gregory the Great, uh, which is related to this question, <laughs> is that uh, do you believe that the primary obstacles in introducing Augustine's teaching in the Orthodox community is the lack of sainthood or do controversial theological differences play a more significant role? So uh, what I mean is that because Ambrose, Jerome, and perhaps Gregory the Grey are the fathers who did not and who did not engage in the controversy of filioque, but Augustine, it was a very significant one. Did this actually hinder uh, the popularity of Augustine's teaching a lot in the Orthodox Church? This is my question, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first question, I would uh, point to uh, San Cyprian, or Cyprian of Carthago. Uh, you know that Gregory, he wasn't known in the East, and, uh, but his teaching on sacraments outside the church and salvation outside the church was very important for all Latin tradition. And what he was saying was that uh, he didn't actually recognize sacraments outside the church. How did he practically respond to it, we don't know but it was a very hard position, and St. Augustine corrected it. And after, uh, more or less, we, in the ancient tradition, we don't have a practice of, you know, uh, don't recognize in sacraments as such, but uh, he w wasn't known in the East because St. Gregory not only because of St. Gregory, but Gregory of Nazianzus confused him with another theologian, not theologian, but bishop, called Cyprian of Antioch. And Cyprian of Antioch was a magician who converted to Christian faith and produced a lot of miracles. So they confused him, and that's why his theology was not uh, studied and... Uh, and accepted and uh, had no uh, no reception. And in the beginning of the 20th century, one of the Russian theologians uh, adopted this teaching of San Cyprian, Hilarion, Bishop Hilarion, not our contemporary, but another one, and applied it to the ecumenical movement, saying that outside the church, there is no salvation, 
let's stop every ecumenism. Uh, one of the examples of how other fathers were received in the today's orthodoxy, you spoke about uh, Ambrose and uh, Jerome and uh, Gregory the Great. I'm not sure that it's because of the filioque. I think that they lived in an area which we, was much more close to the Eastern uh, Christianity because Ambrose was in, the, in Milano and the empire was still more or less united. That's why he was uh, known and he also criticized harshly uh, the emperor Theodosius who was after the emperor in Constantinople. So they knew each other very good. And also you have uh, you have Gregory the Great, who was an ambassador in Constantinople before he became Pope. And uh, Jerome, he moved to Palestine. So he involved himself in a lot of controversies of that time, which were very actual for the East. And Augustine, Augustine was uh, in Carthago. This church didn't uh, exist anymore since uh, 7th century. So. Uh, Virtually, he was one of the Western Latin fathers, but uh, in reality, he belonged to a generation uh, already lost. All this huge tradition started with uh, Tertullian to uh, Hermian of Facunda and uh, Fulgentius of Ruspe ended. And uh, it's a great luck that we have almost all the works of St. Augustine preserved, but uh, his tradition was lost. That's why he was too far away from the Orthodox uh, uh, tradition, I think. Any other question? Uh, in your lecture, you have mentioned that uh, in the 18th century, there is a, um, um, how to say, a breakthrough. Um, Nicodemus, um, the, the reformer of the liturgical calendar, he added the name of Augustine and Jerome into the, the liturgical calendar. So what's, what's the motivation behind this add? I mean, addition of, of the name of a Latin father? There were uh, very few saints in our calendar and many uh, great saints were not in. That was his first motivation. He also lived in, uh, actually we say Greece, but it was not Greece, it was uh, future Greece, Greek Republic, Hellenic Republic, where uh, population were mixed. It. You have a lot of Turkish people, Muslim people, Christian people. And uh, I think uh, for him, the purpose was to educate people through the calendar. Because uh, theology, it wasn't yet the independent state of Greece. That's why theology, there was, were no theological schools or faculties only for small children. And he wanted, through this uh, liturgical old days, piety, educate people to go deeper to the roots. Also, as when he spoke about uh, frequent communion, he was criticized. And people, uh, his uh, adversaries, uh, he, they said, you, Nicodem, Nicodem is taking with him always in pocket uh, Eucharist. He is a magician. And what, what does it mean? It means that people criticizing him were very uh, obscurantist, but also not educated enough. And I think it was a kind of enlightenment in Christian sense of, wor of word to bring to his, uh, to, its, to his own people, I think so. But, but why Augustine? Because he wasn't in the calendar. <laughs> you have uh, also 
some fathers very important for the Orthodox tradition, as, as Evagrius from Egypt, you have also Theodoret of Cyrus, but they are more problematic because they got formal condemnation by, by some ecumenical councils. And I spoke about church of the fathers, it's one definition. Another definition of the orthodoxy formulated in the 20th century was uh, church of the seven ecumenical councils, also very important. That's why Augustine didn't participate in any council, that's why he remained unknown for the most orthodox. And those fathers I mentioned, they did not participate, but they were condemned by the councils, that's why he could not put them into calendar. So the second question for Kim. Uh, you know, for us Protestant, you know we are Protestant church. Our church fathers is Calvin and Luther and, you know, the Anabaptists and so forth. So I, I just wonder, for the Orthodox tradition, do people actually discuss Calvin and Luther? How much they know about this reformer, hero, our church fathers, so-called? I wonder. We have still comparativistic theology in our theological faculties, and there we study Roman Catholic dogma and also Protestant tradition. And uh, we are, you know, very critical towards the Roman Catholics and very sympathetic towards Protestants because <laughs> we say they were. Uh, they were our friends, but they didn't know about us. <laughs> but unfortunately, we didn't go uh, to some concrete theological problematics at, of that time, of uh, Martin Luther, Jean Calvin, which were very important, very interesting also, once I spoke to a Lutheran theologian, Christoph Felmi from Germany, and I just I share some theological views, and he said, you are like Martin Luther in your theology, but you are not Lutheran, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and you know also about Lutheran orthodoxy. So we have an um, Old Testament question, right? It, it's a long way to walk. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Um, you brought us a fresh perspective that Augustine was a heretic, according to the Eastern Orthodox uh, tradition, which, which is refreshing uh, because uh, I'm interested in this different perspective as it has been very difficult for me this evening imagining someone from Switzerland representing the East, whereas a Chinese young theologian from Hong Kong coming back from Oxford representing the West uh, is paradoxical, but it's true. Uh, different perspectives, no longer divided by ethnicity, uh, background. Uh, say for Chinese church, if the Nestorian missionary back in the 7th century was successful, was successful enough, then we would be under the Eastern Orthodox tradition rather than the West missionary movement. Uh, you mentioned that Augustine was called blessed rather than Saint Augustine. Uh, Virgin Mary 
is called blessed, not saint, does it imply any hierarchical order? Or was it just a difference in language? I noticed from your three definition of Eastern Orthodoxy, you did not include the word Greek in either of your three definition. And you mentioned Greek uh, quite late, uh, later on. Uh, but according to our education from the West, uh, they were the Greek fathers and the Latin fathers. Uh, Augustine apparently did not know any Greek or Hebrew. He was the uh, Latin father. Was it because of language that he was misunderstood or categorized as a heretic? Uh, was it language that is dividing the church? Or was it, as you said, political, historical? Uh, I noticed that this evening we have an ecumenical language, which is English. Uh, it is no longer Latin in the West, in Europe. Uh, it's not German, but now it's English. And what about the 22nd century? Would it be Chinese? When the number of Christians uh, from mainland China will overtake you know, the, all, all the other communities, what, what would you uh, say about this issue of language from history and also looking into the future? Please. That's interesting that we call all the Oriental fathers Greek fathers, but they weren't Greek. And uh, we know now more than we knew before. And uh, Theodorate of Cyrus, I mentioned he was Syriac father. Uh, and uh, John Chrysostomos lived a huge Syriac experience. And one of the greatest fathers of the East was Meletius of uh, Antioch. He sent uh, Gregory of Nazianzus to Constantinople to preach on Trinity. He sent Basil the Great. Uh, Basil wanted to be ascetical, and he sent him to be bishop. And he also uh, ordained uh, John Chrysostom. But he unfortunately died during the Second Ecumenical Council 381. But he was Armenian. And I think we have to discover this multiplicity of the uh, of the of, of the of the ancient church, and I think it's uh, there is something very imperialistic in this logic of Greek or Latin, Latin or Greek, and I think uh, uh, the problem is that uh, Latins they usually uh, knew about Greek fathers, and Greek fathers didn't read Latin fathers. The first uh, translations of the Trinitate of Augustine, uh, this famous work, which is actually, you cannot understand Filioque without uh, having read this work, was where it was, it was first translated in the 13th century in Constantinople. Uh, and many details like this, I'm unhappy with uh, uh, I, I, I think that uh, also German and French and Italian and Spanish and in future uh, many other languages will become more and more Christian and uh, uh, important for uh, theology, I think, not only English because Language is also a question of thinking, and we all think differently. And if you impose one language to everybody, you impose your uh, own uh, rules of some internal hermeneutic you even don't see and don't get it immediately. And uh, that's why also I think uh, St. Augustine wasn't not understood enough, because he thought differently. and. Uh, Many Orthodox theologians in 19th century, they discovered Augustine in an academical way, not in a theological way. And they were uh, 
noticing that Augustine have got uh, got a lot of uh, uh, lacks in his uh, thinking. For instance, he identifies uh, Platonism and Plato and Aristoteles. For him, New Platonism is only Platonism, Platonic philosophy developed, and Christian theology even more. Now some scholars think that he did know Greek, but he didn't want to put it ahead. What is important that now we are a little bit uh, different uh, if compare with modernity, and we know that don't know about something is not always bad. That's why Augustine could develop its own the his own theology without knowing Greek theology. And that's why it's so amazing, sometimes very paradoxical, very tragical, but different. And that's very interesting story, what would happen if uh, Nestorian missionaries came to China at that time. But it's also a very interesting question because it's linked with, uh, with all political developments of that time. You know that the uh, Roman Empire became orthodox and all Christians outside of it had to disappear because uh, they were in some way adherent to the Roman faith or to become different, to become monophysites or historians or something like this. And I think this question of uh, Augustine is also linked with the coronation of uh, Charlemagne in the year 800, when he proclaimed himself the emperor. And uh, at that time, you have belief, we do be, uh, they did believe in one God, one Jesus Christ, one scripture, one Caesar, you know? And that was a huge challenge to the imperial church in Constantinople. That's why they started also distancing themselves from the Latin tradition. And you have uh, this coronation of Charlemagne and uh, Photius of Constantinople, almost in the same time, simultaneously polemics arose uh, between Greek and Latin Christianity. So from, from language, um, uh, any related question about language, culture, from the missionary perspective? <laughs> anyway, I'm not forcing you. <laughs> okay, um, any other questions? I have a rather practical question <laughs> this time. Um, it's about... Uh, whether it's easier for people like you to promote Augustine's work in countries or areas which is outside the former Byzantine areas. Because I noticed that in your presentation, you mentioned a lot about uh, different theologians doing the same work, but most of them work in areas like uh, in Europe, like yourself, uh, and also in the United States. So I wonder, uh, is it difficult, maybe more difficult, uh, for you to promote Augustine's work in Eastern, for the former historically Eastern countries? Or is it more or less the same? This is my question. Thank you. In some way, yes, because there is a cliche that St. Augustine was a teacher of, or an example of. Christian penitence, and the focus is uh, on his uh, biography. He was not Christian, he was uh, a heretic before, mani, theater to, mani, to manichaeism, after he ba was baptized by St. Ambrose, and that's all. Uh, why? Because uh, orthodoxy is focused on asceticism, it's enough. It's very hard, uh, very difficult to combine theology, theology, dogmatics, and ascetics uh, lived in, in, in such a way. And also, 
it's very good to speak about yourself, uh, Church of the Fathers, but you need to study Fathers. But if you already called yourself Church of the Fathers, you don't study the Fathers, usually like this. That's why it's very difficult to speak about St. Augustine because everybody thinks that we know about him everything. In the Western or Eastern context, outside Orthodox countries, it's easier because you share your opinion and we are open for every kind of discussion. Any other questions? I know nothing about um, Augustine, okay, and I know nothing about the church history, but I know something about the Psalms, okay. <laughs> and <laughs> my question would be, um, what, 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 what is the position of reciting the Psalms in the Orthodox liturgy? Um, how would um, how would that recitation be um, kind of like a way to form the piety and also the spirituality of the Orthodox believers. And um, well, in order to keep um, Andrew um, um, not so bored, okay. <laughs> so what, what do you think the, um, the position of Psalms in, um, in Augustine's own um, spirituality? So how, how, well, it's a big question, but anyway, uh, I, I think you can have uh, something to tell us about that. Augustine said, uh, Psalms are voice of Christ. That was his saying. And what about Psalms in the Orthodox tradition? I often compare it to the role of the Quran in the Islamic piety, because uh, Quran is, uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, compared to Psalms. We have 150 Psalms, and Quran have 114 parts. And if you call it uh, Arabic psalm book, it uh, will would be easier to understand uh, the structure. And I think Orthodox liturgy and Orthodox piety uh, recite psalms. It depends on language, because if you do it in, in English or in French, you have immediate understanding. But uh, in uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, we do use uh, Church Slavonic language, which is uh, not uh, always understandable. So, and we uh, recite psalms in a very, some, sometimes very anonymous way. We just, uh, we repeat, but uh, some sayings are not understandable because also of uh, lack of precision in, in, in translation at that time. And that's why we need to also to study it and to uh, find there uh, uh, the voice of, of, of Jesus Christ. You know, that's Augustinian approach. What is very interesting that uh, the book of Psalms is, uh, I, I spoke about the Bible in the Orthodox uh, everyday life, and usually we don't, unfortunately don't uh, read the Bible so, so as much as you do, but, but Psalms we read, the Psalms and uh, the whole book of Psalms is repeated many times during uh, Great Lent and also in uh, ordinary time. Many times you have from Psalm 1 to 150 during the week, it's all Psalms read in, in our worship. Very interesting because it's a unique book which is very, very, uh, quite, uh, very, uh, very often known by heart. You know why I was comparing that to to to, to the Quran because many Orthodox say it by heart. You know, like it comes automatically. Even some calculation. Uh, as I was uh, in seminary, I went to his, to a monastery to do some work with monks, and they told me, uh, this work, you recite the Psalm 50, and when you finish, it's done, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, the Psalms are, I think, uh, very important in Augustine. Um, his confessions, um, you can find the Psalms everywhere. And the Psalms is about prayer to him, just like the confessions. The confessions can be 
seen as an extended long prayer. Um, and I think he, in the confessions, after his return to the church, return to his childhood faith, uh, he went on retreat. And, um, and a session of the confessions is actually, actually took the form of a commentary of one of the Psalms. So he, um, I would say that uh, he internalized the Psalms into his prayer and his life. Um, yeah, so I think he doesn't read the Psalms like us. He prays the Psalms. And John Calvin not only recites the Psalm, he, he sings the Psalm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are pretty in line together. Okay. Any question? <laughs> the third one from you. <laughs> Ask only one question each time, so I didn't break the rule. Anyway, um, they, you mentioned, I mean, the discussion we mentioned about liturgy. Of course, in the Orthodox tradition, they emphasize liturgy is something that passed on from the past. So, you know, the Christendom liturgy is supposed to be from Christendom, you know. Anyway, my question is that uh, in the modern age, we talk about colloquial language, we talk about uh, being. Uh, engage with the current culture. And obviously, the orthodox traditional liturgy is very out of touch with the modern culture in many ways. So in the orthodox church, are there discussion about, like, do we need to change some of the liturgy, sing some of the contemporary music instead of, you know, just uh, reciting the psalms in some, you know, you know, you know, those, you know, reciting, you know, do we need some contemporary music in worship? Do they have this kind of discussion in the Orthodox community? I wonder. What is that in such a degree? We do discuss about language, uh, Church Slavonic, Russian, and uh, different questions like this, but not changing completely our liturgy. Uh, for me personally, it was uh, very astonishing that I discovered many uh, meanings of our liturgy I knew since many years as I started celebrating in French uh, in, in Paris as I served there. Uh, those translations were made by uh, those intellectuals exposed by Lenin to France and uh, French was their mother tongue. And they were educated in philosophy and uh, theology, and that's why they translated it in a magnificent way, very precisely, very good, very correct, very theological and profound. When I uh, take a German translation of Orthodox liturgy, it's something I don't understand, even German people don't understand. If we wanted with a with a, with a Calvinia, with a Protestant uh, pastor from Zurich. Uh, she is pastor there, and we wanted uh, to translate it together into a normal German language, you know. Uh, you get the impression that people who translated it into German wanted to say, we are not like you, we are different. We create another language to, 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 to to demonstrate what does it mean to be Orthodox among Germans. But they were Germans, you know, and the same story with Polish language. You know that the Polish Orthodox Church, she, it, it is very small, half a million people, but it's very, it's traditional church of Poland. We don't know about it, but it exists. And they do use church Slavonic language. In some Polish translations, uh, I try to celebrate in Polish language, but it's not Polish we use in our today's life. And it's very difficult, especially in questions of how to understand Orthodox liturgy. I wanted to show it to my Catholic friends, just what we pray. But language was so strange that I felt ashamed, you know? And I think uh, to respond to your question, it's, uh, no, we don't discuss about uh, modern music in our liturgy. We separate both. If you want to pray with uh, maybe young youth communities, where you can 
sing something like psalms, uh, but not in the liturgy. Liturgy is uh, well, more class for us, classical way of, of doing things. But the question of language is uh, very important. Yeah, it seems to me we are really in the mood of uh, exchange now. But uh, our colleagues are a, a, a bit uh, mindful of the time. So, uh, so uh, we, we really have a very um, rich exchange this evening. Thank you very much for all of you for your participation. And uh, especially for those who contributed uh, your questions uh, during the Q&A session. And above all, uh, a big thank you to um, Dr. Sokolovsky and Andrew for um, your message and your response. So um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sokolovsky to conclude our uh, meeting, our fellowship with a prayer. Okay. God, um, it's working? No, it's it's not. Yes. Our Lord, we thank you for our meeting, for our discussion. Help us to be good Christians in the today's world through the prayers of Saint Augustine and all your saints by the power of the Holy Spirit in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. So, um, our Thank you very much. Next comes to the man. Okay. Wish you a very good evening. <laughs>